start our next session. We're going to start our next session. I, 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 Yeah, this one works. Yeah. Oh, oh, I know. I had it unplugged. That was if you use this. You can do it like this. Because I unplugged it because I didn't want two mics up here. So I like to hold the mic. I'm a walker. Okay. Yeah, I'll put, I'll put it here. Okay, I'll put well, it here. Do it first. Okay, I'll let you do it. I'll let you do it first. Hold on. Let me okay, everybody. Attention, attention. Five, four, three, two. This works. Okay, um, real quick. Uh, I'm going to do my last reiteration, um, and hopefully I won't have to do this uh, again. This is mainly for my folks who are watching online. Um, I, I, unless you've discussed something with me, especially when we have breakout sessions, in order for you to get credit, you are expected to be on camera, especially during breakout sessions. I get if you're out for a moment, but uh, it is there's nothing more unfun than someone who especially is in another part of the state hopping into a call and having three or four people in their group and they're not even on camera or participating. Uh, unless you have some kind of uh, circumstance, you were in the hospital or something bad is happening to you. Uh, I, I just I hate to sound like berating, but it is uh, it's it makes it unenjoyable for everybody else. So please participate. Um, you know, again, I can't make you, but um, I, and and I may be kind of you know scattered, but I, I do want to make sure that this is this is important, uh, and the people who are taking this are taking this very seriously. And uh, I, you may be as well. And we are gonna have a lot of sessions. We're gonna be sit and gets. Um, you know, and I know some of you can't make it in person, but if you're, if we're going to go through the trouble of having you in, I think you can turn your camera on at least for the breakout sessions. If you disagree with me, feel free to reach out to me and I'll get back to you Saturday. And, uh, you know, but I, but I really would like to, you know, make sure that you're, uh, that you're participating because everyone here is. And, uh, and if you have an issue with your camera not working, just please let me know. And that's a different scenario. Or if you were in a place where you were taking care of sick family or there's a problem, let me know. But no one has reached out to me to say that. Uh, so uh, I think that's fair. Anyone here? I think that's unfair. I think I'm trying to be fair. I'm trying to be, trying to be uh, the best I can. But uh, with that, uh, the last session of the day uh, is going to be from our, uh, our wonderful CEO, Tally Dippold. Uh, Tally has been with us for a couple of years now, kind of. And, uh, and has really brought something new to our center, uh, and that is with her passion, uh, her connection to her family and the Holocaust, which she's going to share. And one thing Tally wanted to do, I asked her, I said, Tally, would you please, I'd love for you to do a presentation on women and resistance, because she actually used to teach a course on resistance and the Holocaust. I thought, what better thing that she could do is, is, is have this conversation. And then a few weeks ago, she says, can I do anti-Semitism? And all of a sudden, so it, everything changed. And so she's going to do this piece, but actually it's going to give you a lot of resources for teaching about anti-Semitism in the classroom. This is part of the mandate. It is part of the standards. So if you're in a public school, this aligns with what we do. It aligns with what we're sort of do uh, throughout the state. And, uh, and, and all of these resources, if you need anything vetted, you just let me know and we'll have them vetted. But Tally's going to provide some great resources as well and share some of her own personal story. And this will be a lively presentation because Tally's going to touch on all those wonderful things that you've always wanted to talk about. We're always afraid to. So, uh, exactly. So I'm going to hand this right over to Tally. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Hello, everyone. That was a great introduction. Thank you. Um, thank you for giving me the after lunch session. Always a lively time. You guys have been so wonderful. Um, I've been here two years. I've had the honor and privilege to run this organization for two years. It's been remarkable. Um, the number one program that we offer is Teacher Institute. I talk about this all the time. We offer some phenomenal programs to students and everyone else, but there is nothing more powerful that we can do than help educators. We know what you're up against. We know um, what you bring to the students and personally I feel as someone that's been a lifelong study of this topic, you can't possibly have enough resources to become experts in everything so there's going to be things that you have to dive into and, and get more knowledge on it so we are thrilled to have you here we're thrilled to have the group at home. Um, and this is just wonderful as Stephen mentioned. I have a phenomenal presentation on women in resistance. I taught an entire college level class for years. That's what I was supposed to present upon. And then October 7th happened. And um, I am Israeli. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. But since October 7th, my day to day life has been dealing with combating anti Semitism. 
day, day in, day out. I have three kids on college campuses. Um, I used to work for Hillel International. Life changed for, for the Jewish community, for many individuals in the Jewish community on October 7th. And so I went down so many rabbit holes over the past couple months. I'm not an expert by any means. I'm, I say I'm an enthusiast, that's what I do. But I went down so many rabbit holes and I thought, I wish I could just share some of what I learned because I'm Israeli and I'm scared to talk about Israel. So I can't begin to imagine the questions and thoughts and feelings and all these questions. I'm not gonna answer everything in a perfect way. I'm not gonna have all the answers. I struggle with this stuff every day. Um, I talked to about, uh, a couple every week I talk to either individuals who are dealing with anti Semitism in the classroom dealing with anti Semitism on college campuses in their own home. So I am well versed at this and decided that this was going to be a little bit more uncomfortable for me and that i'm going to be a guide by your side as we learn about this together. So if nothing else from this presentation you're going to get an enormous plethora of resources, there is so much remarkable material that has been vetted. The only good thing about the rise in anti-Semitism is the amount of organizations that are coming out of the woodwork with incredible material. So we're gonna dive into all of that, but I have to start by telling you a little bit about myself. And I will tell you, someone once told me that before you teach anything about the Holocaust, whether you're like me, all four of my grandparents were Holocaust survivors. They were the only survivors in their entire families. So they came from massive families in Eastern Europe and Poland, and each one of them was the only one to survive. And the reason that each one of them survived and the reason I'm here only had to do with luck and their age. Because in each of their families, the children that were older than them had their own families, spouses, kids, so they couldn't leave. And the ones younger than them still needed their parents. So to each one of my family members that survived, they were told, you go, you are our future, so you go. And so each one of them dealt with enormous amounts of guilt, being the only ones to survive in their families. And I really believe that that's why I'm here doing this work, that I didn't necessarily choose this work, it chose me. My parents wouldn't let me study the Holocaust. So I did the next best thing. I went to school to study hospitality management because it starts with an H. My parents said, you're just, you're a people lover, just go do that. And I went to go do that and then kept the seed was there that this is what I really wanted to do and came to this topic later in life, ended up getting my master's in my thirties and then dedicating my life to Holocaust education. I was very fortunate. I opened a Holocaust center in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina at a university. And then I heard about the incredible opportunity here in Orlando, Florida, to come to this remarkable 40-year organization. I've been here two years, and sadly, as Stephen mentioned, the end of June ends my tenure here. Um, I am heading back to my hometown of uh, Boston, where we're getting ready to break ground on a Holocaust museum there. Not as not any less important than what we're doing here, but I'm sure that the next individual that comes and works with this incredible, our volunteers and our staff and our team is gonna really take us to the next level. So um, this is my grandmother, one of them. Uh, I have four grandparents Holocaust survivors, but I can really only dive in and tell you why I do this work is because of this uh, grandmother. And um, just to give you context, in a, in my family, there's not one individual, first person in a thousand years not born in Poland. So a thousand years, my parents, grandparents, great grandparents, there is not one descendant. I don't know why I wasted time doing a DNA test. I am 99.9% .9 Ashkenazi Jew. Everyone in my whole lineage is from Poland. And I used to take groups of students, Jewish and non-students to Poland. And it occurred to me what a knowledge gap there is when one of the students turned to me and said, why did they bring all the Jews to Poland just to kill them? And this was a young college student who's Jewish. And I thought, oh my gosh, nobody really understands the legacy of Jewish life in Poland. And so that's sort of where I designated a lot of my interest uh, in life. My grandmother, unfortunately, while she was alive, I did not know anything about her story. She did not want to talk about her story. She put it behind her. I knew her, sadly, as just a amazing cook. If anyone hasn't had matzo ball soup, I highly recommend it. There's some good restaurants. She was just, I, I, I honestly didn't even know what she had been through. I didn't know any of her story. And um, I didn't ever get the chance to tell her how much she inspired me. She passed away when I was relatively young. 
And one day I was visiting my dad who teaches at University of Southern California where the Shoah Foundation is, is uh, housed. And while I was there, I walked into the Shoah Foundation. I said, yeah, my grandparents are Holocaust survivors. And they said, well, why don't you check and see if they left testimony? And sure enough, my grandmother, Alfreda Lassman Eisenman, had left testimony that had a special note on it that could only be shared and listened to after she passed away. So they said, you know, one of our employees is out today. Why don't you go sit in her office and watch the testimony? And so sure enough, that day, about 20 years ago, I sat for four hours and listened to her testimony and met the woman who was my grandmother. I never knew any of her story, found out everything. I mean, this woman spent four years in the Lodge ghetto. Then she was on a transport to Auschwitz, the second to last transport to uh, Birkenau. At the time, it was 1944 because Lodz was very late to, they were a very, very active ghetto for the war effort. Her family was in metal work. She was transported to um, Auschwitz where she tells the story that she was relatively religious and she had to remove all of her clothes in front of family members, in front of other individuals, very humiliating. Then she was transported to Stutthof, a camp that she claims was much worse than Birkenau at the time. Then she was transported to Dresden. She was in Dresden during the bombing of Dresden. Her building was hit by a bomb and she thought for sure that her Nazi captives would then not be as uh, aggressive. But actually from there, she ended up on a two and a half week death march. The only reason she survived was because she was 17 years old. Her and her friends survived. And there's an incredible story that I found years ago, years later. She ended up being a docent at Yad Vashem. She, in her 80s, was a rape crisis volunteer because she had insomnia. And she wanted to help individuals who needed help because she thought she could share her story and inspire others. She was this amazing woman. I knew nothing about her. And now she is my why for doing this work. And for each of you, although many obviously not descendants, you all come from an incredible story and have individuals still alive that you can hear and learn their stories, should have somewhere buried deep down a why you teach this topic. And honestly, I've had teachers tell me in the past, I do a whole presentation of my grandmother, I just gave you the quick version. I've had people tell me that when I tell the story about my grandmother on the death march and how they had, there were four girls walking together and they decided that they were gonna give up. They said, we're too tired, we're starving, we're so cold, coldest winter, they couldn't deal anymore. And they said, next time the siren goes off, we're all gonna jump in the snow. And then when they, the siren goes off again, we, when they usually jump up, they said, we're not gonna jump up and they were gonna be shot in the back of the head. They had it planned out, they weren't gonna get back up. And sure enough, the siren went off and they all jumped in the snow. And a minute later, the siren went off again and all four girls independently stood up again because their will to live was so strong. And I've had educators tell me after I give an hour long presentation on her story, now she becomes the why for many people. And that's what we want. We want you as educators who are conveying this material to have a personal connection. And all of us in our lives have grandparents we didn't get to ask enough questions, people who inspired and motivated us. We have our why. And it changed my trajectory in Holocaust education when I always remember my why beforehand. So the learning today is dedicated to my grandmother who had many stories in her testimony about anti-Semitism. If she knew what we were dealing with now, I always say, there's no way that they would believe where we are now because I would not have believed it. Um, it's really, uh, it was a little dark putting this presentation together as you'll see from some of the statistics and some of what we share. I can no longer do this work at nighttime because it does get really, really dark to realize the moment that we're in now. And so that's what we're gonna dive into. But I want to ask you guys, and this is gonna be informal. This is gonna be everything you ever wanted to ask, but really can't in a setting. Some of what we discussed today, Stephen didn't mention, is not allowed and permissible in the school system because we're really having discussions that you're not gonna necessarily have with your students. So I wanna be a resource to each and every one of you. So this is your chance to ask any questions. We're gonna go into obviously in-depth anti-Semitism. We're gonna do a look backwards historically, and then we're going to do a look. We're gonna run out of time. I think, I think You'll do a quick. Started. I'll do it real quick. Real quick. And then we're gonna talk about contemporary anti-Semitism, how it's changed. We're going to talk about October 7th. We're going to talk about the I word that nobody ever wants to talk about that literally 
people call me and they're like, can I ask you a question about Israel? And I'm like, okay, so this is your chance. The I word, I mean, this has really become a very, very challenging topic. I woke up this morning to news that the Maldives now no longer allows Israelis in. My passport has a stamp of kinds on it because I have three passports, but the one thing they have in common is I have a Polish passport, an Israeli passport, an American passport. They all say born in Israel, which limits my world travel. So the world is changing right in front of us, and we want to be able to discuss and address some of that. So, Stephen, can you go back one to the anti-Semitism? I want to know from you, if you think about one thing that you want to understand better. We all come from different backgrounds. Some of us might be scholars. I know that joining us uh, virtually, there's individuals who hire classes on anti-Semitism. That's something that's just been, they hope that today when they saw this topic, even though it's supposed to cover women in resistance, they were hoping, I hope she talks about Israel or I hope she brings something up. Does anyone have anything like that that they just want to ask in a very safe setting where there are no wrong questions, no wrong answers? Yeah. So before the Holocaust, there was no nation of Israel. After Holocaust, we have Israel. Do, how do Israelis feel about even having, because look at what we're dealing with now with October 7th. Is there regret that we even have Israel? Like it would, would it have been easier if they had never formed into a nation? Like had it stayed? Excellent to, question. Excellent question. We're going we're gonna to talk about that. We're going to address that. So anti-Semitism as it pertains to pre-state of Israel and anti-Semitism as anti-Zionism potentially, because Zionism, the belief that, is, that Jewish people should have a homeland. We're going to address that. Excellent question. Excellent question. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just a statement, and it's going to sound ignorant, but... I've really tried. I don't understand. I just, I don't understand where this comes from. It's not naive at all. That's an excellent question. I struggle with the same thing. Where does this come from? Because I always assumed anti-Semitism was one thing. And then the more that I peeled the layers and started realizing really the conspiracy th nature of it, we're going to discuss that. And I hope you have a little bit of a better understanding by the time we're done, but it's a lifelong pursuit and a topic in and of itself. So excellent question. I'm glad you brought that up. As we get deeper into this, if you have questions, you have thoughts, the question was just, what are your questions that I want to make sure that I address today? So any, anything you want to add? Yeah. I have, I do have a question. Um, sure. What is the main argument or the idea that is most erroneous when it comes to the territory of Israel and other religions around it? Okay, what's the most erroneous? Good, we're going to get into that. We're going to get into that. I would say off the top of my head that there's just individuals that believe, even as you mentioned, that maybe there's no need for a homeland for Jewish people. I think that's what comes up a lot is that somehow Israel just being there propagates anti-Semitism. We're going to discuss that. What she said, yeah, just because of what she said, and I had kind of started a war in the comments a little bit, but be about the territory of Israel. Yeah, I guess because there is the the and this is why I wanted to speak with a rabbi here also about Abraham's promise. This is your land from God like you know where where do Jewish people sit on that in Israel in and of itself. Okay, excellent question. So I'm going to answer that with a question because that's a very Jewish thing to do. Okay. What I'm going to do is, A, that's an excellent question for a rabbi to discuss that example, but I will warn you a little bit about one thing that you mentioned. Jews in Israel and non-Jews in Israel, everyone in Israel has varying opinions. Because if you go to another country and everybody says, well, Americans voted for Trump, they must all love Trump. Oh, absolutely not. 
Right now, so for example, my mom lives in Israel. I talk to her every morning at seven o'clock. Every morning at seven o'clock, I hear a report from Israel. Very, very dark way to start the day. Every day. And I will tell you, what you're hearing on the news or the sentiment is absolutely cannot by any definition be true the same way that if you were reading what's going on in America, you would think that certain things are happening. So I'm just gonna give you a little forewarning that Jews in Israel, because you specifically asked for Jews, although Israel obviously is made up of Christians, Muslims, uh, the, uh, many different groups, do not have one opinion. I can tell you that a recent poll said that about 80% of Jews at the moment want the war to end. So Israel is as complicated as America. There is no one opinion. There is no one group. There are individuals in Israel who very, I'll just use very basic terminology, want a two-state solution. There's people in Israel who want a one-state solution. And there's people in Israel who probably don't want any existence of Israel. So there's no, absolutely no one defining thing. We're going to go into that a little bit, but I still definitely recommend that we connect you to a rabbi because I am not the person to answer any religious questions. I will tell you that. I was born in Israel to a very non-religious family. So a lot of the biblical historic connections, we can definitely connect you with individuals to answer that. Yeah, one more and then we're going to get started. I'm um, frightened to put this into words in general. Um, I have a two and a half year old. She's my only. But the shock value that is being placed on every version of any kind of social media or any kind of news outlet that is being propagated is has gotten to a place where it's so difficult to see and then live my life and be at home with my little mm -hmm. and think okay some people in the world are dealing with this how do I how do mm -hmm. I know that and listen to her get mm -hmm. or get frustrated because she wakes up in the middle of the night how do mm -hmm. both of those things happen simultaneously and I don't know how to make that coalesce without finding a place where the real information exists where you find those polls or statistics because there doesn't seem to be a place you can go to get something that you can trust. So is there somewhere that we can get information to be able to make those things make more sense instead of the scandal of it? So excellent question. I will tell you that number one, um, I use this phrase all the time with my college kids on a regular basis. You can have space for multiple groups suffering. So it could be that what you are hearing in many of the cases, there are many, many, many individuals who are really suffering. So I wish that I had an answer that was better. I could tell you the one thing that helps me, um, I speak multiple languages. So I'm able to read the news in different languages, which really helps. Unfortunately, the best thing you can do is rely on multiple sources of media. That's really the best thing you can do because for example, I read Al Jazeera. You have to read individuals who are not reporting necessarily with the same biases. They have their own biases. So you have to become an expert at translating some of the biases. But I would say read from as many different outlets as you can. And I'll also tell you what I tell my three college students is you have to limit your exposure. Because in all honesty, you just have to limit your exposure. There are days, especially those of us who are dealing with dark topics on a regular basis, we have to live and function in a world where we believe a, we're making things better because that's what education is. And each one of you pick this path for that purpose and finding a way to remain positive in this world has gotten very challenging. But I think that it's an obligation that we have to future generations. Exactly, exactly. So it's the both, it's, it's, it's going between burying your head in the sand. I can tell you that I told my kids, I, I, as I mentioned, I'm not religious, but the Jewish concept of Shabbat, where from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, we now take a uh, social media break during that time. It has been life altering. There's actually a book that came out about the, the Shabbat of social media. So finding ways, and this is true for everyone everywhere, to live in a world where social media is not going away is the challenge, you, you named it. But I do love the phrase, and I use this all the time, that we as humans are capable of feeling, having those very strong feelings, all human beings. Those of us who see ourselves, which by the way, we're less polarized than we think we are, because for the most part, the majority of us that I talk to, and I have many friends on both sides of the political spectrum, the majority of us really are very, very decent and want the same things. We want our kids to grow up in a safe environment, we want to live in a world where multiple perspectives be heard. And we want to be able to hold space and pain for multiple groups. 
Because if we're not doing that, we've lost our humanity. We've lost our humanity. So when people tell me all the time, well, when I watch the news and I see kids being killed in Gaza, I feel bad. Absolutely, as you should. And when I see kids that are still kidnapped and I worry, absolutely, as you should. That is my answer. That is my answer. We can hold multiple perspectives and pain for many groups. So I promised Stephen, no? Okay. So we're gonna keep going because I always underestimate how much I have to say. And that's kind of a joke between Stephen and I. Stephen has a, I don't specialize in the historic roots of anti-Semitism. My focus really is on contempt. Was it Stephen was going to take a look backwards? You wanna do 10 minute? 10 minute, cause otherwise it's hard to put in context. Okay, so Stephen is going to take a look backwards because anti-Semitism, as many of you know, is called the longest hatred, 2,000 years. Recently, I had the opportunity to attend the largest gathering on anti-Semitism education in the world. It was in New York City. If I tell you about the security there, you wouldn't believe me because there were protesters, there were national, I mean, everyone you can imagine to guard, to guard these groups, and these uh, it was the ADL, Anti-Defamation League, which is one of the leading organizations that combats anti-Semitism. And they were bringing people together from all over the world to have this discussion. And I thought I knew most things about anti-Semitism. And I learned something new there that actually for me was terrifying. It's very rare for me to be speechless. And when I learned this, I was absolutely speechless. Can you go to the third slide of the picture with a map? So we focus so much on anti-Semitism and cost that what we sometimes forget is that obviously anti-semitism thrived is that in every single century every single period in history anti-semitism they told us they taught us you can put your hand up like this and there's always been periods where the jews were i will say tolerated and then they were killed the Jews were tolerated and then they were killed, tolerated, killed. And those of us sitting in this presentation were sort of thinking, well, if we were tolerated recently, because if you're an American Jew, I wasn't born in this country, but if you're an American Jew and you're living in New York, like many of my friends, you're saying, I didn't even know about anti Semitism. This is something that happened to my great grandparents, my grand. This isn't happening to us here. Well, now they're waking up to the reality that it is happening here. And this is why I tell, tell everyone, we are right now in a trauma response where many, many individuals in the Jewish community have woken up and realized that life in America is, has a lot of potential to end up like all of them did. And the speaker was very careful to not leave us totally traumatized by saying, look, maybe America will be the first example where Jews will continue to thrive. But historically speaking, it has been proven. Let's just keep that in context that we've been alive in a time where Jews have thrived in, and the tide has been turning very, very slowly. And October 7th, historically speaking, will be a turning point. Like we talk about Night of Broken Glass in history books, it will be a turning point where all of a sudden everyone said, ha, huh, I knew anti-Semitism existed. But what happened since October 7th, no one could have predicted. No one, even the scholars who I meet with regularly who talk about it could not have predicted this. So what we're going to do is we are going to go on a journey today. We're going to discuss the historic roots of anti-Semitism. We're going to let Stephen take us on a quick journey through contemporary manifestations. We're going to do some role playing. We're going to answer questions and have robust discussions. I attend conferences on anti-Semitism all over the world. They talk about a lot of things. They never offer solutions ever. Like I couldn't find them. I came to Stephen. I said, what are we gonna do? We, we can't just talk about anti-Semitism and now people know, okay, there's a big problem. We need to find solutions. So Stephen, being the phenomenal educator that he is, came up with a, a, a program to help people really have these discussions and it's been very well received. And so we're gonna introduce that model, spend some time. We're gonna get into some really, really mucky areas. Like if we have time, we're gonna actually do case scenarios about anti-Semitism as it pertains to Israel. These are gonna be really uncomfortable situations. These are for us to do here in a safe space. These are not for you to take to your students for the most part. There is some propaganda and some other material we're gonna discuss you can take to your students, 
That's not one of them. What I quickly want to highly recommend is, yeah, exactly. What I highly want to recommend is if you have not had time to dive into, and of course this is from 2022, but it's still very pertinent, hate in the sunshine state. I quote this about every day. I travel all over. People don't understand what's going on in Florida. I use this material regularly, highly, highly recommend it. There's also a new report out that is, do not read it at night, called Anti-Semitic Attitudes in America, Top Line Findings. All of this will be shared with you. This is so upsetting. Yes. I'm gonna say that. So there is a link, and it is a functioning link that is in the, it's in, down a rabbit hole this is how i am when you read these reports you're going to realize they're talking about like my friends my neighbors my i mean this is gets into detail about the anti-semitic tropes and how many adults alive today right now people literally that you see in the grocery store there's like 60 percent of americans believe at least three tropes about jews so we're going to dive into that we're going to go into detail I have so many resources. I also highly recommend that at some point you leave through the US national strategy to counter anti-Semitism, regardless of how you feel about it, how effective it is, it's here. And then one phenomenal thing that I'm not allowed to introduce in Florida, sadly, is called the action plan for confronting anti-Semitism in schools. And the reason is because it touches on shh, DEI. So I made all this available because I don't believe in censorship. So some of these things do not repeat. <laughs> I've been told, Stephen's like, you have to make sure that I follow the rules, but there's a lot of material and incredible resources. And then you're leaving with a gift from Stephen, a real gift on how you, every individual can actually take a stand and combat anti-Semitism, which is really remarkable. So we're going on a journey. Stephen's gonna look backwards. Um, then we're gonna talk about how we define and identify examples of historic and contemporary anti-Semitism. We're gonna talk about Holocaust denial, distortion, and demonization. We're actually gonna talk about BDS. It hasn't come up yet, but a lot of people call me, a lot of educators, and they say, please explain BDS they to me. Define that. Boycott, divest, sanctions. We're gonna go into a little bit of detail on it because it's a major area of anti-Semitism. We're this going to talk nice about, bless you, hours. skills needed to respond effectively to anti-Semitism and actions that can be taken. So. Um, we all know this, post-October 7th, the surge of anti-Semitism, which was already off the charts beforehand, um, but it's been rising for years. What started with graffiti and swastikas that now people go, ah, oh, graffiti and swastikas, that's nothing. Bomb threats, targeting Jewish community centers, vandalism, and of course, shootings. 2017, historic cemetery in St. Louis suburbs was vandalized and, and over 170 headstones were damaged. That was the day that for me something broke because the work that I do in Poland is cemetery restoration work because none of my lineage have cemeteries. All the cemeteries were destroyed. So when I hear about cemeteries being destroyed in this country, it's a huge issue, huge problem. Then in 2018, we all know about the Tree of Life Synagogue, the largest killing of Jews in a, in a mass shooting uh, in America, 11 congregants were wounded. So. Now we're gonna take a look backwards. Stephen, you have a limited amount of time. Take us on a journey. <laughs> Hello there. Do you want this one to work? No, does this work too? This works. This works as well. Yeah, I'm really gonna take like I'm, I'm gonna take like five minutes here. We're gonna because because uh, Tali just gave me that list. She wants to cover all that in the next hour, so we'll be leaving at five. And uh, I'll be my, I think, but you no, know, because honestly, I think there's too many there's too many real discussions to be had, especially about contemporary anti-Semitism and a lot of the issues going on in the world today. Uh, so before we get into this, this presentation is not a great presentation to me as far as uh, the elements here, because I know some people will say, "Can I have a copy of this presentation as far as to use in my class?" In your resources under one of the document links that has all of the classroom resources, there are three presentations from ICS 
which is a great organization that actually gives uh, gives resources for teaching younger students about the uh, history of anti-Semitism. And I think uh, there are they are much more valuable as far as because it is part of the mandate for you to be able to teach about the, you know the origins of anti-Semitism. They work really well for our world history class. They work really well for a lot of different elements that you might want to uh, you know when you want to touch on the origins of anti-Semitism anti -Semitism as a whole. So everyone knows anti-Semitism is the hatred, fear, prejudice of Jewish people as a group or as a concept. Uh, this has been around forever. Now the word anti-Semitism was coined by a man named Wilhelm, Wilhelm Marr. Uh, everyone, has everyone heard the, I was gonna ask Tally to talk about it, but about the hyphen. Yeah. There's not supposed to be, a, there shouldn't be a hyphen because, because uh, does everyone know what Semitism is? It's not a thing. <laughs> It's it's not a thing. So you can be anti. Some is the, Semitic is referring to languages. You know, Semitic languages. These are languages like Hebrew or other other Middle Eastern dialects and languages. Can't be. It's not anti that. Anti-Semitism specifically is the hatred, fear, prejudice of Jews, Jewish people specifically. It is and and as as a group or as a concept. So even though. your um your autocorrect will and that's splitting hairs but is it because i mean it's really not and some people want to argue that it's just splitting hairs but as a concept you know why does that term exist it was popularized uh and then you know we start looking at you know all the different forms anti-semitism is unique i always say it's unique because it's taken on different forms a lot of people think of it as as being against jews as a as a religion but it is uh it's taken on forms as being religious uh, economic political and racial those are different reasons why you know jews have been targeted um, why should we care about anti-semitism as a whole anti-semitism is always wherever anti-semitism has been allowed to flourish other forms of prejudice are allowed to flourish it always starts they think of it as the canary in the coal mine you know you say, and this is the thing that people want to ignore and it's because it's oftentimes that form of prejudice that people Or I made this, if I, I made this for the stores on the inside and we used to walk around and all that. If I go to the mall and I make a racist comment, I would think that someone would stop me and would say something that's, you know, I think someone would say something against what I'm saying and rightfully as they should. I guarantee you if I went to that same mall and I said something anti-Semitic, somebody would laugh or somebody would say, well, what's the big deal? There's no Jews around here. They'd say, and I've had it said, I've had it said by fellow teachers. I had a teacher one time actually asked me, he was up part of our ceramics lab. He had a big ceramics lab at our high school. And he said, he came up and said, your kids are always coming to my class so depressed. Why don't you bring them down here for a tour of my firing kilns? And he said, and he said, I'm not anti-Semitic. He goes, you're just being really sensitive. I'm like, uh, and and he, and he just got through telling me about this big march he had been on to, in Washington uh, that was opposing, you know, like uh, a lot of uh, right wing other things. And he was, went for women's rights and other things. But he said, I had no issue. And he goes, and it's not that big of a deal. He goes, it's not like I have any Jewish kids in my class. By the way, he had three that he didn't know were Jewish. Um, so I bring it up. I said, that's, that's a real big point for me. I know that's more contemporary. That's not historic. But honestly, when you're teaching kids about this, this is something where I think it is one of the more acceptable forms of prejudice that's out there when i say acceptable i mean that people don't really care about it it's that it's not looked at as it's a real issue if you're jewish you're not really a minority you don't really experience anything and that and i've heard people say this you know but it's not just a jewish problem it will affect everybody uh if it's allowed to run rampant and it will lead to other things hitler and the nazis necessarily you you saw other groups targeted would hitler and the nazis have stopped with jews or would they have continued on do people who hold that if you see the people up here you know our little group that marched up here uh in labor day that had the big black flag saying jews will not replace us we are everywhere and marched up another just 30 of them just 30 of them it's, what's that what's the big deal it's just propaganda who's willing to listen i think it affected everybody because kids here were afraid adults here were afraid and i had parents coming in going I'm going down rabbit holes. Speaking of Tally, going on rabbit holes, they're going on, they're hopping, finding the social media for these groups like the Goyim Defense League, going and sitting and just crying about like this is what my kids might end up seeing. You know, they're, these people are really like they're 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 found everywhere because they have their own social media pages, 
and they and they broadcast where they're at and they like to and they, they don't and they want you to get in their face they want to cause a problem because then you'll be causing the scene you'll be causing the issue but you know it affects everyone everywhere so how do you you know understand it how do you challenge it how do you combat it and not everyone's you know to me is walking into a situation where they're meeting a, uh, an over anti-Semitic individual, you know, there's someone who's, it's the little nuanced things. Like when I met the lady who's, when I was, um, I was trying to sell my RV and she goes, I got a guy in the back, he'll buy it from you. Just don't let him Jew you down. Yeah. And here's the thing is English was her second language and she had not known. She said, it's something she heard. It's just a, isn't this just something people just say and means don't be cheap. You know, don't let, don't let him cheap you. Don't, that's something she heard. She just thought it was something regular, just something to say. You know, and that's why, you, but we have kids putting swastikas in yearbooks, you know, they don't know what the history is behind that. They don't even know the complexity behind that symbol, let alone the complexity behind anti-Semitism or the history, you know, talking about misinterpretations, you know, why, why wouldn't Jews just convert? Uh, if everyone, uh, these are people who are participating, it's a cultish, you know, they're not, you know, proselytizing. they're not, you know, believing, why is this, this, this one God, I don't understand this, why, it just doesn't make sense. Why, why, why? You know, uh, then you know, being monotheistic, that was one of the first things we talked about is, you know, talk, making comparisons and talking about monotheism versus polytheism. You know, this is, you know, uh, they didn't hate that they didn't like the state. They were conspirators. They were working against uh, this lead. And I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because uh, I want to, you know, talk about the references as, you know, being people being anti-Jewish as being anti-Jewish religious based uh, with blood libel. Uh, Jews were, you know, steal your children. Uh, looking at Simon de Trent, you know, they Jews steal their children, they steal their blood. They'll be using uh, in, in, in matzah for Passover rituals. Uh, Jews are Christ killers. They're in league with the devil. Uh, so the way we deal with that is by passing anti-Jewish legislation, restricting the rights and limit, limiting Jewish, Jewish movement. Um, the Crusades, um, looking at the status, this is even under, uh, this is even under Islamic rule, uh, you know, convert convert under pain of death uh, or be segregated or separated. Uh, Hitler and the Nazis were not the first to make Jewish people wear stars uh, or to separate or segregate or to create ghettos. Uh, and again, I'm gonna give you something that you can utilize in a classroom that's a little better than this. This is just a standard uh, presentation, but something that has some questions and some pieces that you can utilize within the classroom as a whole. Uh, it's not until you know there's um, you know, you start looking at Jewish emancipation uh, under the code, uh, ghettos are abolished. Again, Hitler and the Nazis did not establish uh, the ghetto system as well. That was also, that was also established. Well, I think the first ghetto uh, was established, was established in, uh, was established in Venice. Uh, uh, and uh, you, uh, there's a great little presentation uh, on that where Jews were also, they were forced to wear a yellow hat uh, to identify who they were. So when they went out in the market, uh, that they would be seen as, you know, as separate from you knew who you were buying from or who you were dealing with, they were Jewish or not. Um, there are uh, records of uh, Jewish individuals and Christians living under Muslim caliphates where Christians would wear stars, uh, Jews would have to wear, uh, Jews wear stars, Christians had to wear a cross. Um, and this is, you know, some of the first times where you start seeing ghettos, stars, etc. Nothing Hitler and the Nazis did really was original, uh, except for the processing. Uh, now, I don't know if anyone, has anyone ever here ever heard of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion? Yeah, so this is, um, this is a piece of propaganda that's still used by uh, white supremacist groups today. Uh, this pamphlet uh, or booklet that was created in Tsarist Russia, uh, where they were actually uh, under Russian pogroms, and uh, pogrom is an act of violence where uh, Jewish shtetls uh, were, uh, and, and uh, areas uh, were attacked in massacres and violent uh, and violent uh, um, uh, response to the belief that Jews were not just inferior, but Jews were also trying to take over the world. There's a great, there's a, there's a, this horrible big picture of this man with his fingers in the world clutching in the protocols and he's, and he's gripping and like there's, the Jews have a grip, um, you know, oh, I'm glad you see this. Uh, and this picture, what does this say to, I asked, used to ask my students, what does this look like? What is he doing? Yeah, and why have they drawn him like this? Look at this, you know, the, the image, the graphicness, and what are you being taught to believe here? You know, that, and the whole premise of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion was that there was a meeting 
the Jewish uh, elders came together and, and put together this whole plan to take over the world. Which is it? Are Jews inferior? Are they trying to take over the world? You know, there's this, you know, there's, this is, but this was, this is still passed around in English. We've got, I think we have 15 copies in the back. Uh, and it's still passed around by white supremacist groups. They actually duplicate publications and it gets handed out at rallies. That's why they say Jews will not replace us. Uh, this is a, this is still propaganda that's believed today. And let's see. Okay, uh, this one we go from you know political. Now you see, I've gone. We've gone to religious. Okay, went to political. Okay, uh, there's there's also economic. You know, Jews are in control of all the banks. Jews hold the money in the world. Uh, Rothschilds. Uh, you know, you start seeing uh, this is this is a belief that's still held today. You know, and who would like to share? I know someone here knows why uh, the stereotype exists that Jews control all the money in the world, but why were there Jewish bankers? Yes, I guess who would actually, and, and, and people who would still make money off of that were still people who were not loaning the money, but it was still, but that was the only, that was the only job they could get. Those are the only jobs they could get, whereas you know, as, as bankers or in a lot, a lot of these positions that were typically, that are now considered their very, their very revered positions, their, you know, their uh, educated positions. There, there's so here there's this is what i want everyone to know is for everyone that says you know jews control all the money or jews are all rich my father by the way so i'm not jewish so i just everyone knows i'm not jewish and uh my father is is, a, is pretty anti-semitic and he regularly makes comments and he goes how you know and he'll say he would say little things i said i i know just as many people who are poor who are jewish as i do as people who have money uh i said and guess what no one's the same i said you're there there's not this Cabal. There's not this group. There's not. A, there's no one way. Every single person I know is very uniquely different, and and in their own in their own way, their own person. And I get very. And I, I think over the past two years, I've broken him down a little bit, a little by little, where he's listened to me a little bit more here and there. Uh, but you know, that's still something he believes. But then this one still. This one still exists again. Jews are it's a, as a race. They're racially different. They're a different type of person. They're a sub. They're they're untermensch. They're subhuman. Uh, you know this is the belief. You know that that you know, and Jews. You can't not be Jewish. If you're born to a Jewish parent or grandparent, then you have then you're Jewish. That's that's just the way it is. Tell is that the way it is? Is that? So, but can you imagine the, so we've got a story, uh, Ms. Patel tells, was telling a story of salvage pages and there's a man, his name is Peter Feigl and Peter was baptized when he was younger. Now he was, and his parents didn't actually practice any form of Judaism and there was no Judaic in their house. He was born in Austria and Peter tells a story. And the thing was, is the, under the Nuremberg laws, Peter was Jewish, like it or not. You didn't, you couldn't convert. There was no ability to convert. You grew, yeah, exactly. This is this is part of your DNA. You were you were born Jewish. You had Jewish parents and Jewish grandparents. You're a Jew. There's there is no under the Nuremberg laws. That's that was that's how he was going to be regarded. There was no way to to change that, even though he'd been baptized. Now his parents didn't baptize him to make him you know to actually he just they wanted to have the papers to say that he was Christian, and that's what saved his life ultimately when he was actually crossed over the border from France into Switzerland and his papers said that if his papers had said that he was Jewish he would have actually been thrown back over the border. Well, I guess maybe this is where the rabbi I would have to talk to the rabbi but can you 
David, his great grandma was Ruth, but she was a Moabite woman. So you just said that if the wife, the mom, so the mom wasn't Jewish, but why then did they consider the children to be Jewish? I guess because we have records of that at all. I don't know. I think it's because I'm talking about more contemporary oh, setting okay. for sure, not the religious. So this is where I'm getting ready to hand everything back over to Tally. Uh, but that's really, that is a super brief history. Uh, the resources we have from ICS are actually very good. But again, remember it's complex, it's complicated. But I think going through the anesthetic tropes, introducing students to some of these topics are important because they are basis for prejudice. My little piece here that I've got is how to take a, take a stand against anti-Semitism. I pulled this uh, from two places, and one of them was my, my sociology course I used to teach. And these are basic strategies for like simple things. You meet someone who says something, it's like, when do you speak up? We're when? Not going into it now. Are you? Oh, I don't want to get. I want to be done with this. No. I don't want to come back up again. I, I was. I was. Uh, I was done. Thank you, Tally. Thank you. Enjoy yourself. Oh, you, I, you just. Okay, Stephen's gonna do that at the end because I wanna keep going. But um, as we know, it's on the rise today. This is a direct picture from Charlottesville where once again, we heard chants, Jews will not replace us. So you're gonna start to hear a lot of these um, chants that are repeated. What I wanna talk about right now are three, it's an amazing website we're not gonna get into because of time that goes through every single one of the tropes. We're going to share that ADL has created the most remarkable guide to help understand the tropes because the truth is they're conspiracy theories they're not easy to understand the ADL resource is phenomenal so I don't want to go into too much detail but we're going to go into three different forms so first of all, as you can see and Stephen mentioned this a lot. The unacceptable, which is already borderline are the Nazis lynching Holocaust denial synagogue shootings everyone will agree in society those are not acceptable those are on the fringe. But the covert and i'll tell you you know Jews control Hollywood i'll tell you a story so i'm Jewish my husband's not Jewish. And when I first met him I was 23 years old and he comes from an Irish Catholic family and his sister used a phrase with me and I remember standing there and thinking this is one of those moral decision making moments I just met this woman that I'm that's going to become my sister in law and what do I say she used the phrase he Jewed me down. And of course I, I well, not of course I didn't say anything at the time it bothered me for so long and a couple years later I finally said to her you know that was so offensive, but I didn't even have the vocabulary the words the knowledge I didn't even know what to say. And so for years I would hear things like that and not know how to, what to say. And I'm Jewish and pretty, not shy and outspoken. So how are everyone else in society supposed to know how to address these things if they're not actually taught? And I think Stephen's guide that I'm giving as a gift at the end is gonna actually, it's actually helped me have conversations and I've been able to share it with my kids who, as you can imagine on college campuses are being confronted with a lot of very challenging topics. Um, I hired a Holocaust speaker, as Stephen mentioned, you hear people say things like this all the time. Um, all Jews, all X. There are now organizations that actually came out with reports because one of the biggest misconceptions is, well, people are very rich, are very wealthy. So they came out with reports that actually show that the number of individuals on food stamps is equal to the population for Jewish, the Jewish populations, 2% of the American public and it's actually representative in all the different economic socioeconomic groups. It's sad that we even have to get there, but I think that it does make sense because people are data driven and in an age where information is being challenged, we need to be able to show as much as we can. So there's three categories that we're going to discuss and then we're going to do a little group activity. So the the three examples and I'm so glad Stephen mentioned them. Classic classic expressions of anti-Semitism. We talked about this. This is the plot of the Jews to take over the world, world domination. Blame placed on Jews for the crucifi crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The association of Jews to the devil. I remember people actually asking a friend of mine if she had horns. Yeah, in South Carolina, my friend was the only Jew in her entire community. And when she would meet some people, they would actually say to her like, do you do you do you hide your horn 
turns or where, I mean, literally this is, this is, I was very surprised too. Associations such as the blood libel and poisoning of the wells. Plagues were blamed on Jewish people, the, the, the plagues that were, this was, I think it became, and we know the term scapegoat, it became very easy. You have to blame someone for all of the ills of society. COVID, when COVID came out, there were a lot of conspiracy theories that somehow Jews were behind it. I mean, these are, this is just, as you mentioned, there's no logic. We're not gonna be able to have a conversation and say, this is why we can't, but we can have other conversations. Okay, so we're gonna spend less time focusing on classic forms. Um, new forms of anti-Semitism based on old ideas. Examples include the reappearance and use of classic expressions with depict Jews as evil and subhuman. Many of you have already seen these images, Jews as spiders, bloodthirsty vampires and octopuses. Obviously during, oh, there's tons of cartoons we can share. During the Nazi period, this became very, very useful device because one thing we all agree on in society is most of us don't like vermin. Well, if you start the process slowly, I talk about the boiling rabbits, if you slowly dehumanize, and we know this in society, us and them, whoever the us are, whoever the them are, but if you slowly start to dehumanize with pictures, with messaging, with all these things, by the time you had to actually kill them, it made sense. To many individuals, it was understood that this is vermin, this is toxic, this is hurting society. When you kill a cockroach, nobody feels bad in the world that there's one less cockroach. So this was the process of dehumanizing. And it started, it was very clever. Obviously, Hitler did not invent any of this, but he took advantage of all of it and, and where society was. Uh, Anti-Semitism, not surprising, surges in times of political, economic uncertainty, rapid social change, uses a tool of political manipulation. Someone actually told me, as I mentioned, I have friends on all various political persuasions, that somehow Jews were responsible for the trans movement. And I remember thinking, I don't mind taking credit for that as Jewish people, but just so you know, it's not true. So really the ills of society, when societies are shifting and you need to figure out why is all this happening, we're all looking for an answer. People are looking for an easy answer and an easy solution. Now we're gonna talk about more are the new expressions. So the new expressions of anti that we're seeing, the denial and distortion of the Holocaust, this is becoming more and more common. So denial is actually less common. I had a great conversation with Deborah Lipset, the world renowned expert on this. We're not seeing denial as much anymore because it is the most documented genocide in history, but we are seeing distortion. And if you do a simple Google search, because I had a bet with my kids, they said they're, everything's true online. It's very easy to find, well, yes, we're not saying there wasn't killing, but not on the scale that we're hearing. And what's terrifying about that is the use of facts being questioned. Um, I've helped a lot of individuals who wanna understand better the numbers coming out of the Middle East now, where are those numbers coming from? They're not always trusted sources. So part of the problem is if we're not getting accurate information, how do we decipher that to know what's fact from fiction? What's also happened, the expression as opposition to the state of Israel's right to exist. Now, I will tell you, this is one of the most challenging areas. We have conferences just dedicated to this. Is all criticism of Israel anti-Semitic? What, where is that line? Where's that border? We're gonna discuss a little bit about that, which can include demonizing of its people and its leaders and drawing comparisons of contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis. You don't have to look far now to find individuals talking about a genocide that is occurring in the Middle East and the Jews or Israelis, because they're conflated, Jews and Israelis are very different things, but the Israelis are being accused of a genocide by many organizations, which is quite ironic to the fact that the state was the largest home to Holocaust survivors. And a lot of that has to do with the comparison. People are literally saying uh, a, a people that went through a genocide in our lifetimes, so we're not talking about that long ago, are now perpetuating a genocide. So all of this is where we want to spend our time. I think a lot of these concepts are relatively new to some of you, and I think we can delve into some of the questions that you asked. So let's take a second to talk about BDS since I brought it up and what the relation to BDS is to all this anti-Semitism. How many of you have heard of BDS? Not very many, very surprising. That's actually, I don't know how I feel about that because BDS, 
has been around for a long time, but it hasn't picked up traction in all groups and at all times. So BDS stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. And it's a campaign that is started in 2001. So it's been around for a long time. And the campaign is endorsed by pro-Palestinian organizations that call, it's a key tactic to get global effort to delegitimize and isolate Israel. So one thing that I've been quoted saying that I really believe in, that I was in the paper for saying this is, criticism of Israel is 100% acceptable. Israel is a democracy, the only democracy in the Middle East. And just like we in America, half of us want to say bad things about one presidential candidate, half of us want to say one bad thing about another, we can say bad things about President Biden and it's all legal and fine. We can criticize President uh, Trump and it's all... Similarly, you can criticize a leader of a democracy. People in Israel criticize Bibi Netanyahu or Benjamin Netanyahu regularly. Saying things about a leader is not the problem. So giving your opinions and thoughts is not where the problem is. What happens with um, divestment, the, the movement, was originally, and now we know from what's going on on college campuses, that these initiatives on college campuses started decades ago. This is not a new phenomenon. We've known about this. This is part of what's been happening on college campuses, was having uh, groups divest investments from companies that advocated for the aid of Israel's occupation. So boycotting of Israeli products, professionals, professional associations, academic institutes, and artistic performances. So BDS does nothing to promote Israel-Palestinian negotiations or reconciliation. So throughout history, recent history, there have been many almost successful attempts, we could say, at discussing and navigating the politics in the Middle East. The most recent might be we, we, that we think of as the Abraham Accords, but we know historically there were many, many opportunities. as divided as the population in America. I have relatives in Israel who are very pro two-state solution and fought tooth and nail for it. And I have some that are on the religious side and feel different. It's a democracy. And in democracy, one of the things that thrives is the ability to have difference of opinion in a safe setting. So where does this cross the line? The BDS move. Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip encounter hardship as a result of Israel security policies, but there is no Israel policy or plan to segregate, persecute, or mistreat the Arab population. So many people feel that the comparison to Israel to apartheid South Africa is unfair because there were not segregation laws like there were in South Africa. These are actual, I've been in discussions with people where I've framed this up. There is an Israeli Declaration of Independence. Many people don't realize this because it, many people don't feel it's being upheld, but it does exist, that safeguards equal rights for all citizens and Israel's acceptance of a two-state solution as an outcome of bilateral Israeli-Palestinian negotiations has been in play for many, many years. In other words, there's ways that we can talk about this topic. I'm pleasantly surprised in a way that this doesn't come up a lot, which means that our students aren't necessarily, this isn't front and center. Let's talk quickly about the tropes that you're hearing about um, the, the, the myths that we're hearing. So I'm going to go through them. So we talked a little bit about this. Stephen mentioned this. Jews have too much power. Jews are disloyal. Jews are greedy. Jews kill Jesus. Jews use Christian blood for religious rituals. This is one of those people call me and say, we just don't even understand. We don't even understand because they're conspiracy theories. They're not based in any fact or truth. Uh, the Holocaust didn't happen. And anti-Zionism criticism of Israel um, 
situations. Okay, so we're gonna break up and do a little group activity that I hope is gonna bring a lot of this to light and then we're gonna have time to answer questions. So we just went over the three, um, the three types of anti-Semitism. Classic expressions, new forms of anti-Semitism based on old ideas and new expressions. In your groups, we're gonna divide you into groups, including the online groups that Steven's gonna manage. You're going to go over these statements, their statements and decide whether they are classic, exp classic expressions, new forms or new expressions. And then you're gonna spend some time in a group looking at some of these pictures and deciding which pictures represent what and how they connect the historic anti-Semitism to the contemporary anti-Semitism. No, these are the ones I sent you today. No, they're in, but they're in the, okay. Yeah. So, so everybody that's online, uh, everybody go to, if you're, if you're online, okay, for this, for this session, there is a link that is in the session description. If you're in the agenda, scroll down. There's a link that will actually take you up. Everyone here could check for me if you're in here, so I can see. Uh, there's, it's just a link within this session and it should open up a folder, a Google Drive folder. They already shared the chat. Okay, perfect. Perfect, even better. So that's the link. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and, everyone's get broken up into groups. Uh, hopefully everyone's got that online. You're all set, it's been shared in the chat. We're gonna spend about 15 minutes going to groups. Yeah, so we're gonna put you into groups. Everyone online, we're going into groups. Groups four. Uh, everyone online, home real quick. Uh, do do an announcement about the broadcast about them. Make sure they're expected to be on camera on. And you'll see who's. Oh. Hit. Not now. Just X out.
You can keep these handouts after today also, but we'll wrap up in three minutes. You want to, of course, of course. Yeah, five minutes till. Five, no, five, well, five minutes till three. Yeah. I want to be done so I can be prepping them for tomorrow. Of course. And uh, because some people have already said they've got things they've got that they, they only came to say. Of course. Oh, I know. We're finishing on time. We're finishing on time. Two minutes. I knew that you end up for this. No, this is just right amount of time, though. It's very dark. Epic. You don't want to. We're doing the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. You know what we talk about? You know, but this to me is like, when I was doing this work. This is practical. Guys, this is what we should be. I tell you, you know what's funny? That's what I said. I said, you know, something never fell apart. Can anybody hear me? I got bounced out of my breakout room. Yeah. Well, things did fall apart here, and I didn't, but I would go to ADL. Yeah. I think so, too. I think so, too. Oh, my God. ADL. It's like the mothership. I'm sorry, can anybody hear me? I got bounced up in my room. Can anybody hear me? Okay, one minute to wrap up. I just put on the one minute warning. Thank you. So. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. I, I, I guess I'm not going to be in my breakout room. Yeah, I, I missed the breakout room too. I keep getting kicked out. talking yeah. about that on college campuses is that coming like rooting from like professors or from student groups or student groups influenced by ideology Both. Or academia Both. Okay. there are professors on campus that lead the charge on the campus and in many cases students can outside so on a lot of the college campuses when there were the riots going on they found out that there were a percentage of infiltrators from outside the community of every single school that has encampments for children that are coming into influence the students. So it's a combination of both. They Scary, mean, huh? Yeah, but it's interesting because when Hitler wanted to get to people, what did he do? He went to the young people. Yeah. And you go to are we supposed to go back? Exactly. Yeah. I think we're going yeah. back. Yeah, I take your, I think we are, so I'm not, not at this point, I'm not worried. And they also follow their heart. They're like, well, that yeah. is your heart. You want to be part of Where is the it? good guys yeah. without the nuanced understanding of what's going on. And it's been like, I mean, you know, it makes me crazy. Oh, LGBTQ plus friends are telling me. Oh, I'm going to go to the All of them are 
nothing. Oh, exactly, exactly. Hi, Kitty. Very interesting. Fascinating. Fascinating. Okay. Okay. As sad as I am, we're going to stop the uh, sessions because we want to keep going. But let's quickly see what you guys came up with. So, uh, the Saudi professor in his interview in 2005, Dr. Abdullah Muhammad, what do you feel about his comments? What did you guys come up with? Which type of anti-Semitism, classic, new form, or new expression? Any group want to share their thoughts? Yes. OK, new expressions, denial, distortion of the Holocaust, uh, opposition to the state of Israel. Did anybody agree, disagree? Any group have a different answer? Agree. OK, OK. Farrakhan. February 27th, 2011. I'm not even going to read his comments. How did, well, how did groups feel about that comment? Interesting. New form, classic. OK, you're going to be asked to defend why you think new form. And there's no right or wrong, because honestly, it's how you read the quote. Okay, okay. So you see it as a new form, new expression, and you, many groups saw it as a classic form. Okay, okay, so the Satan comment. And I can see how based on the date and the, and the context, it could also be seen as new form. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay, last one, and then we're gonna move on to something that I found that's very interesting. Uh, Joseph Goebbels. The Reich Minister of Propaganda, 1933 to 45. What do we feel about his comment? New form. Okay, new form. Anyone else feel different? He said classic. Even in his comments, he desecrates our people. You can see the us and the them forming. Spit on our ideals, paralyzes okay, the strength of the nation. Rotten. Correct. Correct. It could, yeah, it could be perceived as classic, right? Because he's depicting. Um, <coughs> yeah, the definitions are very nuanced. So you guys had that as classic. So the dates don't play as much of a role in the new form unless you're talking about Israel. So where Israel comes into play is in the uh, new expressions of anti-Semitism is the state of Israel's right to exist. For the most part, that's the big issue. Okay, a lot came up about Israel in this conversation too. We talk about new forms of anti-Semitism. And what I didn't get to is how we can decipher, we talked about Israel as a democracy, how can we decipher when, uh, we cross the line and there's a very easy test that people use that all of these handouts are gonna be available, made available, but um, condemnation of Israel crosses a line. And this is why, have some of you heard about the IRA definition of anti-Semitism? It's, it's very controversial. In Florida, it's less controversial because the uh, Florida, uh, I think Senate agreed to pass it. The IRA definition of anti-Semitism puts limitations on what is considered anti-Semitic as it pertains to Israel. So it gives examples, it says, if you follow this, and IRA is the International Holocaust Research Alliance, Remembrance Alliance. So if you look up IHRA definition, it's a, it's a little bit controversial. Um, people have come out on both sides, so it's up to you to determine. But what's controversial about it is how it addresses the topic of Israel. And so this is one of the big debates. The uh, former minister in the Israeli government, his name is Natan Sharansky, came up with a way for us to test 
whether a comment distinguished between legitimate criticism of Israel and anti-Semitism. And he coined it with the three Ds. And the three Ds, and you have a handout that you're going to receive on this, are demonization, double standard, and delegitimization. So this answers some of the questions that I was hearing from you about Israel. So here's how they classify, and then we're going to open it up to questions because we're going to get out on time and I want to answer your questions. So demonization, when Israel and its leaders are made to seem completely evil, when Israel's actions are blown out of all sense, sensible proportion, when Israel and Israelis are equated with Nazi Germany and Nazis, and when Israel is seen as the sole cause for the situation in the Middle East, it's considered anti-Semitism, not legitimate criticism of Israel. So that's the demonization. The double standard, which is, once you learn about this, to me it was so eye-opening, when criticism of Israel is applied selectively and in a grossly unfair manner, and Israel is singled out when clearly immoral behavior of other nation states are ignored. For example, Israel is criticized by the United Nations for human rights abuses, while the behavior of known and major abusers, the list goes on, China, Iran, Cuba, Syria, is ignored, that is considered anti-Semitism. So it's a double standard. So we want to criticize some people for human rights violation, but not others. That's one of the ways that we hold a mirror against the comments. And then delegitimization, and this was a question that you had that stuck in my mind, is when Israel's fundamental right to exist is denied along, uh, alone among all people of the world, it's considered anti-Semitism. So the delegitimization of an Israeli homeland Israel is considered anti-Semitic. Anti-Zionism is how it's referred to. So let's dive into that and answer some questions. This is now a chance for you guys to really get to ask the questions that we didn't cover. We know the session was jam-packed. As Stephen said, I have, you know, 50 more slides and a couple more hours worth, but we made a commitment that everyone's leaving on time. So what questions have I not answered yet or that you want to learn about from Israel? I can't talk about the religious perspective, but I can tell you that there are many people that feel, this is one perspective, that had Israel not existed historically, when there was not a homeland for Jewish people, it was continuous, as we mentioned, the paradigm of Jews in the diaspora, which is away from their original homeland, end up historically being killed. So anytime that they have not had a homeland, now we're proving that even with the homeland, there are obviously challenges, but when there's not a state or a place for Jewish people, then that ultimately most scholars that I hear from, so I don't want to say there aren't differing opinions, the question is, if there wasn't a homeland, wouldn't it be safer for Jewish people? Historically speaking, the answer is no. That it is never proven to be safer, that many people feel that they defend Israel as a homeland because historically Israel, one of the reasons that it was founded was because after the Holocaust, there was an understanding that if two out of three Jews in Europe at the time were murdered, we need a place that is safe. And I believe the statistic that I read to someone is that even today, the world population of Jews is not the same as it was pre-Holocaust numbers. Most scholars, particularly because I'm not a biblical scholar, go back 2000 years, but you're absolutely right that there is a evidence that it was the ancestral homeland. There's a lot of that evidence, but exactly. But I don't, because I just say I'm not a scholar in that area. We talk about the 2000 year history, but you're absolutely right that It's a good question. I don't know. It's the way that I was taught that we go back 2,000 years. Yeah, um, because, because the last 2,000 years is considered the common era that leads up to now. If you go back before that, it doesn't look any better for Jewish people. You have the, uh, you have the Egyptian captivity, the Assyrian captivity, and the Babylonian captivity, so, and, and mass death with all of them. So 
it doesn't look any better in that because that's just not the world we inherited. You know, we inherited the, the Greco-Roman world, and that's why there's a division made that calls this the Common Era. What in Christianity BC. is known as AD. Right. I think 2000 years is pretty impressive for an oppressed people. So I think that historians go back 2000 years, as you mentioned, because that's the standard. Yeah, exactly, because we don't go into biblical history. Okay, that's a great question. Um, I am not a political science specialist. The question is, why don't the Palestinian people cast out Hamas? Because there is a distinction between the Palestinian people and Hamas. Um, I'm trying to think of, a, of an answer that can go on the record. Um, so I would say that there has not been, even with the, the PLO and other organizations trying to manage Gaza, Gaza the, as a territory has been a, a large challenge from the beginning. So I would say that many Palestinians are for Hamas not being their leaders. So number one, a lot of the assumptions we're making about that is what we're seeing on the media and on the news. But I like to tell people when they call me and ask about the individual person, I'm not sharing my personal opinions, but I do believe that there are people in Gaza who has ver have varying opinions the same way people in Israel have varying opinions. So we don't know what the people of Gaza really are thinking or feeling because we don't have free press in that area. We don't really know. The same way that we don't know that the numbers are reporting or anything we're hearing is necessarily fact, there is no way of really understanding. My assumption is that people are looking for true leadership and they're not finding it, obviously, in Hamas, a terrorist organization. So the, the people in Gaza suffer greatly from their leaders as well. So then you go into democratic values of was it a fair election when they were brought on? You know, you go into a lot of the principles. So I think there's a lot of different ways to answer that. That's how I'm going to leave it. I, I think that's a great answer for a political scientist. If anyone else has any thoughts on that, that has more uh, nuanced answer. It's a good question. There are no questions that have solid uh, answers, unfortunately, in this topic. Yeah. Well, I will give you another perspective. There's also the similar accusations that people in Israel are raised to dislike Arabs. So I will just tell you that I believe that propaganda or that element exists in both areas. And that when you're dealing with any conflict, that the whole concept of us and them historically is proven to be a problem. Because in Israel, not everyone agrees with the same ideals. So can I tell you that everyone is raised with love in their heart and to believe that they should be neighborly? I don't think that that's the case as someone that was raised there. I think that that's the ideal, but I think that in this country itself, you can see that there's varying degrees of how we all talk about, look at one particular topic. You can pick just refugees or immigrants and think about how much your home of origin dictates how you feel about that particular topic. So I would say it's very similar there, that there's not a, a one perspective on how it's addressed. But yes, there is evidence based. You can go to the schools in both places and see that there is propaganda used on both sides. Okay, Stephen's handing out this wonderful um, document that we're gonna have to unfortunately end on. I'm gonna go over it really quickly. Just or do you want do you want to go over it since it's your baby? Okay. No, no, no. So really, I'm I'm very grateful that you took the time to learn more. This is an evolving conversation. There are no right or wrong answers. There are no right or wrong questions. So thank you for asking. 
I am available as a resource to anyone that wants to dive deeper into this topic. I'm going to provide you through Stephen incredible resources that I have dug myself into a hole with. If you have specific interest, I'm part of a study on three G's, grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, on the epic epigenetic changes that occur during trauma. So um, I have a lot of research on that that I'll share. So feel free to email me. Stephen will share my contact information and I'm always available to any of you on social media or wherever you, wherever you can find me. You're gonna learn about this golden little nugget that when Stephen introduced in groups, people feel really can move the needle forward. So thank you all so much for your time and interest. Okay. Thank you, Tally. I, I wanted to make sure that uh, we, we oh, yeah. honored everyone's time um, and make sure that we get everyone out on time. I think we're gonna have a few more people in tomorrow who are not able to attend. We're gonna have to print out some more of these. So don't take, don't have the last one out. And we're going to, I'm going to give it, I'm actually going to, I'll make more copies. We're going to make some more copies of this. Okay. So one of the things that we, you know, we're talking about on, uh, with dealing with anti-Semitic tropes, a lot of things, these are responses that this could apply in the workplace, but primarily this is like, you know, dealing in schools. You could argue uh, these are uh, responses that were, uh, I created out of a sociology class that, uh, that I did. So this could actually be to any form of prejudice, but, you know, asking people, you know, who are in a situation, you know, what do you speak up? What does that look like? Are you trying to build a bridge? Or are you trying to build a wall? You know, is it safe to speak up? How do you speak up? Uh, how well do you know the person? What else is happening? We always tell people to speak up and say something, but what does that look like? I mean, is that say, are you okay doing that? And when you do it, what's your end game? You know, am I going to get in your face and challenge you and cause an argument? Is it going to change your mind? We had one of my favorite uh, speakers. We had here's a man named Daryl Davis who managed to get 200 members of the KKK to renounce the Klan through conversation. We had a whole exhibit here with uh, Daryl, and he's come twice, and we 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 talk a lot. And I asked him, I said, "What do you do?" He goes, "What is your key to your success?" He goes, "I go to every conversation with some level of curiosity." He goes, "Even with a Klan member." I go to every conversation wanting to know why, like really not like, what's your problem? Like, it's more like, I'm really like, what shaped your worldview? You know, is it safe? Can I do it? And then what's my end game? What am I trying to do? If I'm just going to get in your face, you, every here, if you, if you have children, you know how kids respond so well to just, you know, you telling them what to do, you know, it doesn't require threats or anything, does it? I mean, assume good intent. Also, if it's a small, if it, you know, we go right, we jump to a lot of, a lot of conclusions, but not everyone is ill intended. Maybe they don't know. I mean, maybe they really don't know. Not everyone's a white supremacist. Not everyone's an outright racist. Sometimes you actually have to assume good intent. If you want to actually bridge the divide, you're going to have to assume some type of good intent. And maybe I didn't, I know you didn't really mean any harm, but what you said really hurts. It re I mean, I really don't like it. I've used that before. I've actually said that before. And if the person really knows you, because typically you have to know somebody in some way, they're not going to respond like, well, don't be, a, you could have someone go, don't be a baby. That's saying, I'm sorry, you know, didn't mean to. Um, it's, it's something. Or you can ask a question. So what do you mean by that? And what are you trying to say? You, you, you said this, you said, don't Jew me down. What, what, is, what did you mean by that? Where'd you hear that? I'm seriously, like, I'd, li I'd like to no, know, because, and here, here's the opportunity to say, do you know where that comes from? Do you know what it means? And do you know how it can, you know, make other people feel? You can interrupt and redirect. Let's not go there. I'm not gonna have that. I have to do that. Now, here's the thing is, I have lots of family, but that's the, where I have to go. Where that's my, that's, that's my, that is where I have to go. We're not gonna go there. I had to actually say to my father, I said, let's not go there. And if you bring it up again, you're not gonna see your grandchildren for another year. That happened, that happened twice in two, three year stints. Uh, each time he's had a realization uh, and he's come back, but it's a challenge. Um, broaden to universal behavior. Lots of people have that quality. You're saying all Jews are this. Well, you know, I know lots of people who are this and who do this. You see how you could use most of these in any form of prejudice? I mean, you could use these in many different ways, but to kind of challenge, you know, lots of people, you know, uh, eat this, do this, act this way. You're, you're attributing it to one group of people, but lots of people do this. Uh, make it individual. You know, are you talking about somebody or somebody in particular, some uh, individual? Because that's another thing is we don't, we, you wanna break the stereotype. 
you know, you want to show this is a person's behavior. I, mean, I used to say, I said, just, you know, there, there, are, there are lots of people that are individuals and have, and just because you're part of a group doesn't mean that that's necessarily all that you are. You know, you're part of a group, if you're male, or if you're female, if you're Hindu, if you're Muslim, if you're Christian, if you're Jewish, if you are, you know, whatever you, however, uh, the components that make up who you are, that is not all that you are. You know, there are other things that make you human that separate you and make you an individual, and you have to call that out. And students, a lot of times, we, we get oversimplify. Well, you know how they are. Who? You know, well, I saw how so-and-so acted. And I, I do this with political conversations as well. I know, you know, I, that, that's, that's a family thing as well. That's always kind of fun. My last and my favorite is say ouch. And I mean this, I mean this, just, just literally just like, ouch, that hurt. And I just kind of am done. And I've actually stopped people in their tracks. You'd be, it sounds childish and simple, but just ouch, I don't have to say anything else. And I leave it at that. And people are like, did I do something? Did I say something? Well, do you want to know? And then, and then it, it comes, becomes a conversation. And it has become a real conversation with the intention of actually changing a mindset, not with me just telling you that you're wrong. So it's 2.53. Uh, you know, uh, we're not going to do the activities, but I was going to get these. Does anyone actually think this would be um, an acceptable classroom poster? As, a, as an actual poster size? Well, I thought about actually making some poster sizes of these and giving them to everyone who attended here for getting some posters. Um, a couple, so what I want to do in the last couple minutes, exactly, that, yeah, well, could modify it, yeah, exactly, modify this. Um, a couple things about the rest of the week. Uh, tomorrow is going to be a, uh, a great day, and not that listening to me and Tally wasn't just fantastic and blew your minds, and you're just like, wow, I'm going to go home and be talking about it forever. Uh, I know you'll probably leave here and continue the conversation on throughout the night and want to walk in tomorrow with so much excitement. I know people are people online who are, uh, John, we're looking forward to seeing you coming in person, Don't, but uh, hopefully you're not sick. And, uh, and, and hopefully we'll see. And, and is Mark going to come tomorrow? Oh, fine. Uh, Mark hasn't been on camera all day. I hope Mark's okay. Um, so I do check on everybody. Hopefully everyone will be able to join us. But tomorrow is uh, the morning's be Defiant Requiem. Uh, so it, it's going to be really, uh, it's actually speaking of Ale Alexandra Zapruder who did the salvage pages. Uh, she's first thing in the morning along with the conductor. I do believe, and we, uh, we, have, a, we have another surprise. So those of you who are here, uh, and I don't hold me to this till I confirm it, but when Defiant Requiem comes as a concert in September, one night, Everyone here is going to get tickets to go. <laughs> save seats for educators. Save seats for yeah. now. I've got to we have to confirm that because they are it is separate from our organization. We work with Defiant Requiem, so no, the Tali said so. Oh, no, you have to confirm this before you leave. She doesn't leave until the end of no, June, so Tali said. Okay, so um, so Alex Zapruder is going to talk about the educational component because there's some great lesson plans that are associated with this. But also Murray Sidlin, who is the artistic director and conductor, uh, is going to be presenting as well in the morning. And this is actually an amazing story. It is really incredible. I, mean, I really actually think you'll get a lot out of tomorrow morning sessions. Tomorrow morning session. Uh, then in the afternoon, uh, coming up from uh, the Miami Holocaust Memorial. If you've never been, uh, I've got a good friend of mine who I just think she is just she is fantastic. Um, Dr. Nicole Freeman, uh, she is the education director at the Miami Holocaust Memorial, and she's going to talk about education as a form of resistance. Um, and she is a she is a really uh, really great. Um, and then I just want to kind of quickly go over the rest of the week. Um, Wednesday morning is Joni Sherm. If you haven't been to their, our center exhibit, Adventures Against Our Will, Against Their Will, and uh, My Dear Boy, she's, uh, she's a local 2G who's written a couple of books about her father who survived by going to um, the Shanghai ghetto. Uh, Joni is, uh, you know, she, she speaks and does a lot. Uh, Ms. Patel actually uses her work in her class for a, it's a genealogy project. Uh, uses her work in her class. Uh, she's really wonderful. She'll be here on Wednesday morning and the afternoon. Another a friend of mine, his name is Mark Grudgel. He is uh, formerly the United States Holocaust Museum. He's also been a teacher fellow. Uh, he's written a couple of books. He's got a book you're going to get called Think Higher, Feel Deeper. It's Holocaust uh, Pedagogy in the Secondary Classroom. Um, and he's going to be teaching forms of resistance, which is like what were forms of resistance during the Holocaust and what do they look like? 
And then on Thursday, uh, we're going to have uh, uh, Dr. Suzanne Brown Fleming. Uh, and uh, again, uh, in case you didn't get the memo, uh, Dr. Fleming is actually from Georgetown. She's also of the United States Holocaust Museum. Uh, she is the senior project lead and actually works directly with the Vatican and has actually been in the Vatican archives and will be uh, uh, joining us in presenting kind of the Catholic Church and the Holocaust. Uh, and then uh, in the afternoon on that Thursday, we're going to have Alan Hall. Alan will, Alan will, he's amazing. I mean, he's really, he's got, he has an amazing story. He's an amazing storyteller. Uh, his, I really believe that his story will stick with you, will resonate. He is a Holocaust survivor. Um, and he's just, he was, when I heard him the first time, I was very impressed uh, and uh, expect, you know, really to have him kind of blow you away. Alan's a little political. Uh, but uh, I'm going to tell you what I tell everybody with my Holocaust survivors. I don't correct them. I don't challenge any certain things. I said, he's got a, I, he won't let me. He, but he's very, I said, but he's very, he's a very powerful storyteller. Uh, then we're going to wrap up on Friday morning, which look at women uh, in resistance during the Holocaust. When we're having actual one of our presenters from Echoes and Reflections. If you've never used Echoes and Reflections as a resource for Holocaust education, go to it, make an account. Uh, their uh, timeline of the Holocaust is one of the best interactive timelines that exists on the web. It is really amazing. Uh, it's something I'd really get a, get a hold of and use, but they're going to come in. They're going to provide practical resources. Their, uh, their anti-Semitism work that they've got for presenting in the classroom is really second to none uh, and is really well done. So I hope we've got a full fleshed out week. It'll be engaging. We'll try to keep it moving, keep the pace going. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask uh, during the chats, ask, send me messages through Ahuva. I did for some reason, I think I accidentally posted my phone number. Uh, I do get notified. You hear my phone beeping. Although that is actually someone asking a question every five seconds. So if I don't respond, I apologize. I'll respond as quickly as I can. And then uh, if you need anything, just reach out. Thank you all so much for a wonderful first day. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. And real quick, real quick, I'm going to I'm going to send a link out. I'm going to send a link out that will have it's your reflection for the session. I'm going to send it to you like 10 minutes. I'll send it out via the chat. Uh, I'll send it out in a message or an announcement. I just